This talk will be on the orbit and globe, and I have no relevant disclosures. This is, uh, when we look at the um, anatomy of, of the globe, it, it, the, uh, it's really important to understand exactly what the various anatomic layers are. And I know it can be confusing, but this is a, a nice example uh, of a sagittal images of the globe itself. And this is an example from a seven Tesla MR that was uh, given to me by my colleagues in, in Melbourne. And what this demonstrates is the following, that when we look at the layers of the globe, this outer area right here is the sclera. And the pink area right here is known as the uveal tract. Now, the uveal tract is comprised of three areas. And this is the choroid, which is in pink. Then we have the ciliary bodies, and then we have the iris. So the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid are all part of the uveal tract. And deep to the uveal tract is the retina. So when we actually look at the light coming in, the light coming in passes through the cornea. It goes through this anterior chamber. It then gets refocused on the lens, and the lens focuses this on the retina. So below the retina is the choroid, and eventually that ends up being transmitted from the retina all the way back into the optic nerve. So when we look at the seven Tesla imaging, the choroid is a very vascular region of the globe. So on this contrast enhanced T1 weighted seven Tesla uh, image, we can see this enhancement of the choroid, and we can also see the enhancement of the ciliary body and eventually into the iris. So it is um, important to understand um, these various layers because when we initially start talking about congenital malformations involving the globe, a lot of this relates back to the various anatomic layers. So the first thing that we'll start off with, um, just to emphasize the sclera, this is actually my eye. So, you know, I've been playing sports for a long time. I've been playing basketball for 30 years, and I went up for a layup, and an overzealous defender ends up um, hitting me in the eye. So this is my iris. Uh, you can see the redness, and this little guy right here is actually a fingernail that resulted in a partial tear of my sclera. Now, luckily, it didn't go all the way through. This was the fluorescein. You can see it was sort of a pretty bad, um, pretty bad cut there. Um, but luckily, um, it was only a partial tear of the sclera, and then I was treated with anti-inflammatories, um, and eventually I, I did get better. But the, that is, uh, if you will, a, a tear, a partial tear involving the sclera. And luckily the sclera, as I learned, is, is a pretty tough covering. So the next area that we'll talk about um, when it comes to the globe is this area in pink right here, which is referred to as the, as I mentioned before, the uveal tract. Now, back when I was in medical school, what I learned was that a coloboma, which is seen here, was a defect in the iris. So I remember specifically seeing this when I was on my ophthalmology rotation. But I remember when I started my radiology rotation, we started looking at cross-sectional images. This was what we would refer to as a coloboma, which was this outpouching involving uh, uh, the wall of the globe. And I never could figure that out. It took me about 20 years to figure it out. But eventually what I realized was that a coloboma is a defect in the uveal tract. So if the defect occurs within the iris, as is seen on your left, then this is referred to as a coloboma. But then on the other hand, if the defect occurs posteriorly involving um, the choroid back here, then that results in a radiologically a coloboma. So this cannot be seen clinically if it's involving the posterior aspect of the globe, but we can see these um, uh, when we look at cross-sectional imaging. And on fundoscopic examination, this is an example of the cavitation that can be seen in a coloboma. So co coloboma is a congenital um, malformation or congenital defect in the formation of the uveal tract. So when we talk about the differential diagnosis for orbital lesions, um, the, what we're the classic teaching is that it, is it intraconal or versus extraconal? And the intraconal is defined by looking at the various muscle layers. So here we can see the superior rectus muscle, the inferior rectus muscle, lateral rectus muscle, medial rectus muscle, and the superior oblique. And then everything within this is in the, co if you will, cone of the orbit. 
Now, you know, I have to say this, I've been doing this, I trained in the last century. And, and I remember when I remember, I was actually uh, there the first time gadolinium was given at the Brigham when I was a resident. But the majority of how we would image the orbit at the time was using CTs. And this evaluation and this relationship with the cone of the muscles really arose from CT. Really now in, you know, in 2022, what, what I think what we should be doing is defining the differential diagnosis for orbital masses based on the relationship to the optic nerve. So when you are looking at MRs involving the optic nerve, you should always be able to see your muscles as is seen here, but you should be able to see the optic nerve surrounded by the CSF and then surrounded by this dural sheath. So when we, you know, for me, um, the conal, extra conal is really a very high level view, but if, you, but if you understand the anatomy, then you should be able to make a differential diagnosis based on the different anatomic structures that you can see within the orbit. So this is just an example of what we used to see and what we now see. So this is back when I was a fellow, uh, again, 25 years ago, where when we would do, in this case was a gradient echo image, we would try to take a look at the CSF surrounding the nerve and we, we could see it relatively well. This patient actually had left optic neuritis, so it was hard to see, but you know, it's a leap of faith that's a little bit brighter, but you can certainly reliably see the cone. So hence we would look at this interconal versus extraconal. But now when we look at the heavily T2 weighted images, we should be able to see this level of detail. So if you are looking at orbital studies, I encourage you to always do coronal T2 weighted images with fat suppression. And to make sure you're doing it just right, you should be able to see this level of clarity and also see the, um, the, the uh, anterior skull base and the gyrus rectus. So this is an example of optic neuritis. So <clears throat> when we look at optic neuritis, again, in the, if you, I will say this, in the old days, we would say optic neuritis is an, abnorm, an intraconal abnormality. So this is diffuse enhancement involving the right optic nerve. On this coronal fat suppressed T2 weighted images, we can see abnormal enhancement of the nerve. Yes, technically it's, it's, it's intraconal. But, you know, quite frankly, it is something that's involved in the optic nerve. So, you know, just say that there is just an abnormal enhancement involved in the optic nerve. Now, when you do things just right, you can actually grade the, the uh, acuity or the acuteness of the optic uh, for optic neuritis. So in acute optic neuritis, what you see is diffuse enhancement of the right optic nerve. And then when we look at the heavily T2 weighted images, Yes, you can see maybe a little bit of increased signal in the surrounding CSF, maybe with a leap of faith, some increased signal involving the right optic nerve. But the main thing for acute optic neuritis is to see that diffuse enhancement. Now, optic neuritis, again, it's associated with multiple sclerosis. And so you can say that the imaging findings are somewhat similar as well too. So for instance, if you have acute multiple sclerosis that indicates an active inflammation and eventually goes on oftentimes to form gliosis. And that's similar to what we see with optic neuritis. So in the subacute phase of optic neuritis, we don't see any enhancement at all in the nerve. What we are starting to see is abnormal signal involving the optic nerve and increased CSF surrounding the optic nerve. So notice the caliber of the nerve in the subacute phase um, is relatively normal, but we are starting to see increased T2 signal within the nerve and increased surrounding CSF. And then once we get to chronic optic neuritis, then eventually what happens, if you will, we sort of get that gliosis involved in the optic nerve where we see this little pinpoint a decreased caliber of the nerve surrounded by the CSF. So not only can we make the diagnosis of optic neuritis, but we can grade it based on, um, the, on the imaging findings to whether it's acute, to whether it's subacute, or whether it's chronic. Now they have, um, there are now um, different ways to look at primary demyelinating processes involving the brain. So again, when I grew up, everything was sort of MS. But now we can look at specifically molecular markers, and now we can look at different causes of demyelinating processes involving the brain. And so, yes, the most common still is multiple sclerosis, but we can look for neuromyelitis optica, which is the associated with anti aquaporin 4. And recently, we can now look at things such as myel myelin oligodendocyte protein. So, this is MOG. So, all of these are different primary demyelinating processes of the brain. 
And as a result, what has been shown, and it doesn't work all the time, but sometimes just basically looking at the pattern in, of optic neuritis that these patients can present with, we could potentially predict the type of demyelinating process the patient has. So if you have a patient with unilateral optic neuritis, that is more suggestive of multiple sclerosis. If you see this diffuse enhancement of the optic nerve, which is um, not as, and the patient doesn't have the severity of the optic neuritis, then this is more suggestive of NMO, otherwise known as Devix disease. Devix disease is, the uh, uh, de primary demyelinating process involving the spine associated with optic neuritis, now we call it NMO. But if you have patients that have very severe optic neuritis um, and the enhancement especially has a predominance for the anterior two thirds of the nerve, then this is more suggestive of myelin oligodendrocyte um, um, glycoprotein MOG. Now I will tell you there have been some uh, papers that have specifically tried to be specific in mapping the degree of enhancement. Um, I'm not sure if that's really going to hold the test of time, but in general, if you see more severe bilateral enhancement, that's more suggestive of MOG as opposed to NMO. And if you see unilateral enhancement, then we can think of multiple sclerosis. So other causes of um, involvement involving the optic nerve, this is diffuse enlargement of the optic nerve surrounded with increased CSF. This is the classical appearance of optic nerve glioma. So here we can see diffuse enlargement of the proximal prechiasmatic portions of the optic nerve. Here we can see diffuse enlargement of the optic chiasm. And on this contrast enhanced T1 weighted image, we can see diffuse enhancement and a sausage shape appearance of the optic nerve, all classic uh, of optic nerve glioma. And when we see this, we, always, we obviously have to think of, <clears throat> excuse me, of a neurofibromatosis type one. But again, I wanna emphasize you try to steer away from intraconal versus extraconal. If you understand the anatomy uh, of this area, the muscles, the nerve, the surrounding CSF and the dura, then you can be much more specific with your diagnosis and not have to, if you will, give a laundry list. Another example here, this is a patient that quote unquote has a, a intraconal mass involving the orbit. And when we look at this on the contrast enhanced T1 weighted images, what we see here is a central area that's not enhancing, but we can see the peripherally enhancement. And when we look at the coronal images, what we see here is diffuse enhancement of the dura and compression of the optic nerve. And again, if you understand in that anatomy, you see this diffuse enhancement with compression of the optic nerve, then we can suggest that this is the diagnosis of meningioma. Now we're gonna see a case later where we have the similar peripheral circumferential enhancement, but that's not gonna be compressing the nerve. This is compressing the nerve, and this is the classic tram track appearance that we can see with optic nerve meningiomas. Now this has that similar finding that I just referred to. This is diffuse enhancement involving the dura. This is that sugar coating enhancement, but notice that the caliber of the optic nerve has been preserved. So when you see something like this, this is more leptomeningeal spread. And we tend to see this in this particular case, this was sarcoidosis, but we can see it in other etiologies too. And those other etiologies include lymphoma, leptomeningeal metastasis. You can also see this in tuberculosis Tuberculosis. So if you come from a portion of the world that's endemic with tuberculosis, just realize that tuberculous meningitis can give you a similar appearance. Now, this is an example of lymphoma. So lymphoma is, um, uh, involves the orbits and it can involve the optic nerve. Now, um, one thing that I can say about lymphoma is that it tends to be uh, a little bit more advanced when it presents and it can be relatively bulky. So this, notice the bulkiness of this enhancement. And again, notice how it has a more of a softer appearance to it. It's not really, again, compressing the optic nerve, but rather it has diffuse enhancement and more of a bulky appearance. So this is more of the classical appearance of, of, of lymphoma. Now, what has been described is that lymphoma has been associated with decreased ADC. Now, what I do wanna say is I've seen numerous retrobulbar masses like this, and some of these have turned out to be lymphoma, and the ADC can be confirmatory, but don't base your diagnosis purely on the ADC because I have had some people say, well, the ADC wasn't decreased, then how can it be lymphoma? 
realize the ADC, especially once you get below the skull base, is fraught with a lot of artifact. So if you are going to use ADC as a frontline um, assessment and a sequence to help differentiate different tumors, you have to make sure that your diffusion imaging is of really, really good quality. Because as you know, once you get below the skull base, there's a lot of artifact. But yes, lymphoma has been associated with decreased ADC values. Now, this is an example of a disease entity that we're seeing more and more, and this is ischemic optic neuropathy. And ischemic optic neuropathy has been divided into two types. It can involve the anterior portion of the optic nerve. So this is referred to as Aon, A-I-O-N. And it can involve the posterior portion of the optic nerve, which is Pion, which is posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Now, in general, the uh, ophthalmologists tend not to image if there's anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And it, this can be relatively common. And this is associated with optic disc swelling. Pion disease is something that has been uh, uh, has reached our literature um, quite frequently um, in the recent years. And this affects the retrobulbar optic nerve. And ophthalmologically, the exam is oftentimes normal and difficult to diagnose clinically. So this is a rare entity, and there are arteritic, non-arteritic, and perioperative causes that result in this posterior optic neuropathy. So this was an example of a 29-year-old female who presented with acute lymphoblastic leukemia and presented with total vision loss of the right eye. So when we see um, the contrast enhanced study, we can see abnormal enhancement here involving the optic nerve. And again, this in itself is nonspecific. As I mentioned before, it could be due to lymphoma, leukemia, a lymphoproliferative disorder. But notice on the coronal T2 weighted images, there's high T2 signal. And then when we look at the DWI, notice there's abnormal signal extending along the optic nerve. And then when we look at the, the ADC maps, notice there's complete loss of signal involving the optic nerve. So this is the classical appearance of posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. In a way, I don't want to be too dogmatic, but it, it is ischemia. And I don't want to say it's necessarily an infarct of the nerve, but this result is resulting in ischemia involving the uh, posterior optic nerve, hence the term pion. Now, the remainder of the presentation is really going to be based on the clinical history. So we spent the first part of the presentation talking about the globe and the optic nerve. Now, the remainder of it is going to be based on the history that someone can present and that that one or two word history that you'll get and try to give you an approach for different disease entities for patients that present with that clinical history. So the first clinical history that we'll talk about is patients that present with leukocoria. So leukocoria is the cat's eye or the white eye, and what it means, it's the loss of the red reflex. So remember in the earlier slide, I said the, um, um, the light comes in, it goes through the um, pupil, it goes all the way and hits the retina. Behind the retina is the choroid, which is very vascular. And then when the light comes back, because of that vascularity, you get what's called the red reflex. In leukocoria, you have absence of the red reflex and you get this white appearance, this cat's eye or the white eye. And that is due to some type of mass that's located in the globe that prevents the light from hitting the retina and below the retina is the choroid. So the most common cause of a intraocular mass in a child is retinoblastoma. So retinoblastoma, the majority arise in patients less than three years of age. It's a calcified intraocular mass. There's a hereditable form that involves the 13, a chromosome 13, which is the RB gene. Um, it can be bilateral and it's felt to be, have this two hit model where there's two uh, actual uh, specific mutations. So this is an example of the calcified intraocular mass seen radiologically, and this is what's seen fundoscopically. So if you do see a calcified intraocular mass in a child, then this is retinoblastoma. Another example of retinoblastoma, this was a patient that had bilateral retinoblastomas. So this retinoblastoma is of the same case, the soft tissue in the bone algorithm. So we can see the bilateral retinoblastomas. 
Notice how it's sitting right on the, the retina. So therefore you lose a red reflex. And this was a patient that had a known left retinoblastoma, but if you really look clear, carefully, there's a small little calcification on the right side as well too. This patient's too young to have a choroidal angioma, which can have a similar appearance in an adult, but this actually was a very small retinoblastoma involving the right lobe. Now, when we look at retinoblastomas, we look for the calcification on CT, but you also want to perform MR. On MR, what you look for now, especially in retinoblastoma, is does it extend posteriorly to involve the posterior aspect of the globe, and is there abnormal extension along the optic nerve? So in this particular case, we see the normal appearance of the optic nerve on the right, and we can see a little bit of enhancement on the left, and this is indicative of the retinoblastoma extending along the posterior aspect of the globe and involving the most anterior aspect of the optic nerve. So this is an example of another cause of uh, leukocoria, and this is Coates disease. So what's Coates disease is a retinal telangiectasia. And this is a nice example here demonstrating the telangiectasias associated with Coates disease. So essentially you can think of this as almost leaky capillaries because the telangiectasias don't have the tight connections. So when you have blood extending along these vessels with a leap of faith, you can almost see these leaking out. And when these leak out, what ends up forming is that it, it forms is this exudate, and this exudate layers, ends up layering along the retina because the majority of the vascularity is within the choroid. So as a result, the other name for Coates disease is this exudative retinitis. And again, you can see why because of those leaky vessels. So Coates disease is typically unilateral. It's more common in males and females, typically occurs between the ages of six and eight, and is associated with the leaky blood vessels. And it's also associated with a um, small eye and in patients with leukocoria. So Coates disease, just remember small eye, leukocoria, and the exudative retinitis or these retinal telangiectasias. Now, this is a, another cause of a patient that has um, a small globe, and this was persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous. Now, what this is, is how this works is the following, is that as the globe develops, you have a primary vitreous that ends up um, getting resorbed to form the adult vitreous. Now, anytime that you have a, um, a retaining the primary vitreous, then this is referred to as persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous. And as a result, you can see that if you have this persistent primary hyperplastic vitreous, notice where this is located. In this particular case, it's right behind the lens. So if you have the light coming up through the lens, you can see that it's never going to make it to the back of the globe, and therefore you end up having that red nucleus. So this PHPV is oftentimes associated with this central sheath right here, this central canal, and that's known as cloacase canal because there's normally an embryonic hyaloid artery that ends up getting resorbed. And with primary hyperplastic vitreous, there is preservation of this little hyaloid artery, and that hyaloid artery is associated with this retainment of the, hyper, of the primary vitreous, which is hyperplastic. So just realize PHP can occur anterior and posteriorly. In this case, um, these are examples of primary hyperplastic vitreous involved in the anterior portion of the globe. Now, other causes of uh, leukocoria can be due to uh, things such as infections, such as toxochoriasis. So toxochoriasis is oftentimes unilateral, and it's oftentimes associated with um, pets, specifically with cats. So with toxochoriasis, you could have the small little granuloma here, which is depicted here in the fundoscopic view, and this can result in a posterior pole granuloma, and as a result, this can result in leukocoria, and if it's not completely treated, it can result in a chronic endophthalmitis, and an endophthalmitis, as we'll see later, is this infection involving the globe. So if that infection is never treated, then this is going to result in a chronic shrunken um, globe. In a way, it's just the, the dead eye, the, the, end, the end result of an untreated infection. Now, one of the no another common thing that we can see is the detached retina. So this is our globe right here. 
And again, I went over that anatomy. So the blue right here is the sclera, the pink right here is the choroid, and the yellow right here is the retina. So the way that I think about it is that you have this central sheath right here, and then right below it, we have the retina, which is located in yellow. And you can see based on this umbrella, the retina, if you will, is expanded. So everything that looks like this is the retina. Now, what happens when you have a detached retina is that this umbrella ends up closing on this central sheath. So this is that closed umbrella. This is where that retina detaches. And you can see that if you're looking down the shaft with the leap of fate, you can see how this retina now is all bunched up upon itself. So as a result, when you have this bunched up retina, you have this umbrella that ends up closing and below the retina, you oftentimes have this fluid. So on this coronal T2 weighted images, you can see that this retina has separated from the choroid and you have all of this subretinal fluid. So this is bilateral retinal detachment. And on this axial images, we can see this retina has separated from the choroid and all of this is fluid in the subretinal space again, due to that retinal detachment. Retinal detachment is associated with patients that are diabetic, they are oftentimes smokers. When this happens, they can see flashes of light, they can have visual loss, sometimes they can see a waviness. Uh, one of my friends unfortunately has a, a chronic retinal detachment, he was telling me about the waviness. It's diagnosed on uh, um, fundoscopy, on fundoscopic evaluation, and if it's acute, it is a surgical emergency. So what we initially talked about right now was in uh, Elucocoria, and now let's talk about another common thing that you'll see, and that is infections involving the orbit and the periorbital area. So the first infection that I'm going to talk about, and I touched on it a little bit earlier, was endophthalmitis. So endophthalmitis is an intraocular effect, uh, infection, and it is a vision-threatening emergency. Endophthalmitis is this infection involving the globe that's typically due to direct inoculation from trauma, surgery, or a corneal infection. You can have periocular thickening and enhancement, and it's oftentimes treated with intravenous antibiotics and or a vitrectomy. So this is an example of a patient that had endophthalmitis, and this endophthalmitis was due to an infection that was a, a severe infection that was involving the skin, and that extended deeply to involve the globe. So notice the normal appearance of the globe on the left-hand side. We can see the enhancement of the choroid, and we can also see enhancement of the ciliary bodies. Now, in this particular case, we can see all of this enhancement involving the periorbital region, but notice we, now we have abnormal diffuse enhancement of the choroid, and this choroid is actually separating out from the sclera. So this is actually enhancement of the choroid, and now you have a subchoroidal infusion, uh, 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 fluid. And behind the globe right here, we can see this abnormal enhancement. And on this coronal images, nicely demonstrates the enhancement of the sclera, the enhancement of the choroid, the subchoroidal effusion, and also this diffuse enhancement. So again, very severe infection that in this case extended posteriorly to involve the dura surrounding the optic nerve. So this is a clinical example and radiologically what we would see in endophthalmitis. Now, when we talk about infections involved in the periorbital region, this is typically classified by the Chandler classification. So the Chandler classification of orbital infections are that we divide this into preceptal, postseptal, subperiosteal abscesses, an orbital abscess, and a cavernous sinus. So this is the progression of disease that starts from the peris preceptal cellulitis and eventually extends eventually results in cavernous sinus thrombosis. So preceptal cellulitis is a skin infection that's anterior to the orbital septum. And now the thing is, is how do we find the orbital septum? Well, this is an example of preceptal cellulitis right here. And this is an example of preceptal cellulitis. And in order to be preceptal, it has to be anterior to the orbital septum. So the challenge is, is where is the orbital septum? When we look at this anatomy that's located involved in the medial aspect of the orbit, we have this area here, which is the anterior lacrimal crest and the posterior lacrimal crest. Now the orbital septum attaches to the posterior lacrimal crest. 
So on this image right here, we can see this orbital septum attaching to the posterior lacrimal crest. So as a result, any infection that's anterior to the posterior lacrimal crest is preceptal cellulitis. And in this particular case, we can see this diffuse preceptal cellulitis that does not extend posteriorly to this posterior lacrimal crest. So by definition, this is preceptal cellulitis. This is typically due to a skin infection. It may be due to associated rhinosynovitis up to 40%, and it's typically just treated with antibiotics. So in generally, it responds very, very well. But on the other hand, if you have an infection that extends posterior to the posterior lacrimal crest, then this ends up resulting in postseptal cellulitis. So postseptal cellulitis is a skin infection that's posterior to the orbital septum. It's usually secondary to adjacent eth ethmoid sinusitis, and this requires broad spectrum antibiotics. So both of these are examples of postseptal cellulitis. Note, notice how they're posterior to the posterior lacrimal crest. So if the patient has any type of decreased ocular motion, and you as a radiologist say that there's infection extending into the orbit and it's postseptal cellulitis, these patients are typically admitted and treated with IV antibiotic therapy. So that's why it's important to know exactly where that orbital septum is and the full extent of the disease. Another example here, this was a patient that had postseptal cellulitis, and this was a patient that was treated um, actually overseas with high doses of steroid therapy. And this was unfortunately an example of mucor mycosis. And this was the black turbinate sign right here in a patient with mucor. And this was that same patient that developed postseptal cellulitis. But unfortunately, in this particular case, the postseptal cellulitis was due to mucor mycosis. Now, if you have that postseptal cellulitis and you end up developing a small little abscess, then this by definition is subperiosteal abscesses. And the vast majority of subperiosteal abscesses are secondary to adjacent sinusitis. So one of the most common areas that you'll get subperiosteal abscesses are adjacent to the ethmoid sinuses, and occasionally you can see them arising from the frontal sinuses. Now, one thing about subperiosteal abscesses is that the bone is oftentimes intact. So if you're ever worried or con confused whether or not that this is actually a subperiosteal abscess and the bone is intact, it still can be. Why? Because you have small little emissary veins that extend from the ethmoid sinus to the uh, periosteum, and this is what can give you this subperiosteal abscess. So if you see this and the patient has decreased intraocular motion, these patients are oftentimes taken to the operating room. Now, in very small cases, they could be treated with IV antibiotics, but certainly they require hospitalization. And then the, the determining whether or not they require surgical drainage really is based on other clinical findings. Another example here, this was a subperiosteal abscess that arose from acute sinusitis involving the maxillary sinus. So here we can see this large subperiosteal abscess involving the floor of the left orbit, in this case associated with air, and this was um, with air. Now, if this continues to progress, this can go on to develop a frank intraorbital abscess. So this is that fourth stage of the Chandler classification. So here we can almost see the three globe signs. So we see a globe on the right, a globe on the left, and there's this fluid collection involving the superior portion of the orbit. An intraorbital abscess is due to untreated subperiosteal abscess or prior trauma, and this is a surgical emergency. In order to confirm this, you can perform ADC mapping, and here we can see decreased signal involving the ADC, which, confirm, which confirms the abscess. And then when we look at the sagittal T1 weighted images, what we see here is diffuse enhancement involving the meninges, and this is an intraorbital abscess associated with meningitis. Now, this was a, a case of intraorbital abscess that I saw many years ago. Um, this was a, a case that demonstrated a bilateral mucosal thickening involving the maxillary sinuses. Uh, and then I remember I looked at this and this is the first image that I saw. I'm like, that's kind of weird. They have air in, involving the um, 
the retrobulbar area. And then when I looked at all this disease, we can see that there was a fracture right here involving the floor of the orbit. And this ended up being an intraorbital abscess that extended from an acutely involved maxillary sinus. So this was a frank intraorbital abscess that was uh, uh, that extended into the orbit from acute maxillary sinusitis. Now, the end stage of this is cavernous sinus thrombosis. So this is the fifth stage of the Chandler classification. So if you have a severe infection involved in the orbit, you can have retrograde spread along the superior ophthalmic vein, and this can extend all the way into the cavernous sinus. So cavernous sinus thrombosis is a complication of untreated orbital infections. As I mentioned, it's due to retrograde thrombophobitis into the cavernous sinus, the patients typically present with fever, vision loss, and ophthalmoplegia, and these patients are uh, treated with antibiotics, uh, they're hospitalized, and they may or may not get steroids. So this is an example of a large clot involved in the cavernous sinus, and notice how there's no enhancement involving this venous structure of the cavernous sinus. And in this case, the same patient, the large clot, and this patient, when we gave contrast, has this diffuse meningitis um, that's extending intracranially, again, from the cavernous sinus thrombosis. Now, I show this paper because this was one of the phase, first papers I ever wrote back in 1995. We published this in Applied Radiology. I was a, a resident uh, that wanted to do a, a fellowship um, at University of Florida. So um, I kept bugging my mentor at the time, Tony Mancuso, to uh, give me a paper. And he said, to finally, to get me off his back, he gave me to look at six cases of cavernous sinus thrombosis. And I show this for a couple of reasons. And, and number one is that what I remember about this paper was that there were six cases of cavernous sinus thrombosis. All five of the patients ended up dying. And unfortunately, all six were initially on the initial films. And this is back when we had films. So these were all unfortunately overlooked. So it makes you uh, remember that, you know, the only way you can make a diagnosis is to think of the diagnosis. So ever since then, I've always tried to think of septic cavernous th sinus thrombosis anytime I see an infection involving the periorbital area. And number two, for the residents out there, if you ever do write a paper, whether it's a small case report or a small case series, you do become an expert in your field. So that's why I would suggest being very open to any opportunities that you can have to write these very clinical papers. So this was one of those examples. This was a patient that came in, um, <clears throat> ended up having a small little six nerve palsy. You can see the disease here involving the sinuses. The only findings that he had was a six nerve palsy clinically. And what we can see here is enlargement of the superior ophthalmic vein. So in a patient with a six nerve palsy and enlargement of the superior ophthalmic vein, what we want to do is to think of cavernous sinus thrombosis. So we were concerned about it. In this case, we ended up getting a CTV. And what I want to point out here is notice how there is diffuse uh, enhancement here involving the dural sinuses. So that tells us that we hit the venous phase very well. But notice how there's no enhancement involving the cavernous sinus. So this, in fact, was absence of flow involving the cavernous sinus, and this was indicative of cavernous sinus thrombosis. So the last thing that we'll talk about is proptosis. So when we talk about proptosis, you know, what are the causes of proptosis that we have to look for? So when we talk about proptosis, the first thing that we'll talk about is an abnormal globe. So a staphyloma is an abnormal globe, and that's abnormal protrusion of uveal tissue due to weakening of the cornea or the sclera. So just think of a staphyloma as a very weak eye, and it's typically due to inflammation or some type of degenerative conditions. There's actually five types of staphylomas that I'm not going to get into, but radiologically, we can make the diagnosis of staphyloma by looking for an asymmetrical enlargement of the globe. Now, there is this disease entity that's called buphthalmus, and buphthalmus is a clinical diagnosis, and it's referred to as a cow's eye. So we don't want to say that this is buphthalmus because that's a clinical diagnosis, but we can say it's a staphyloma, and that staphyloma we can diagnose by the enlarged globe. And again, it's due to weakening of the cornea or the sclera. 
Now, one of the most common causes of proptosis is thyroid ophthalmopathy. And I think you're all familiar with thyroid ophthalmopathy. This typically involves the extraocular muscles and involves the inferior in the, and the medial rectus muscles. And eventually it can go on to involve all of the muscles. So this is just a nice example here, even of enlargement of the superior rectus muscles. Now, when we are looking at thyroid ophthalmopathy, it's important to, to mention the enlargement of the muscles, but you also want to look at the orbital apex and look at the fat surrounding the optic nerves, because if the fat around the optic nerve is absent due to the compression by the enlarged muscles, and the patient does have vision loss, then those are indications for the surgeons to go in there and do an orbital decompression to take the pressure off the optic nerves. When we perform MR, we can see diffuse enhancement of the extraocular muscles. And one of the characteristics of thyroid ophthalmopathy is that it primarily involves the muscles, but it spares the tendons. So thyroid ophthalmopathy tends to spare the tendons, but involves the muscle belly. When we talk about thyroid ophthalmopathy, we often also mention pseudotumor. So pseudotumor is a disease that can involve the orbit and the globe. And there's six types of pseudotumors based on the locations. So you can have pseudotumor that involves the muscles. This is myositic pseudotumor. And on the next couple of slides, we'll show how to separate this out from thyroid ophthalmopathy. You could have pseudotumor involving the sclera. You can have pseudotumor involving the nerves, gives you perineuritic pseudotumor. You can have pseudotumor involving the lacrimal glands. You can have a diffuse pseudotumor and you can have pseudotumor extending into the cavernous sinus. And that's referred to as telosa hunt. So that's the acute inflammatory process that gives you uh, a cavernous sinus syndrome also known and the, the disease entity is telosa hunt. Now, Thyroid ophthalmopathy can sometimes be confused with pseudotumor. They can have some similar presentations, but just realize pseudotumor is an inflammatory process, and this oftentimes presents with pain. So one of the differentiating features between pseudotumor and thyroid ophthalmopathy is that patients with pseudotumor will present with pain. But also thyroid ophthalmopathy is predominantly involves the muscle belly and spares the tendon as is seen in both of these cases. And just realize pseudotumor can involve the muscle belly, but it can also involve the tendinous insertion. So one of the characteristics to separate pseudotumor versus thyroid ophthalmopathy is that pseudotumor can involve the muscle tendon, whereas thyroid ophthalmopathy spares the muscle tendon. Now, one of the diseases that has gained a lot of press over the last 5, 10 years is this IgG4-related disease. So IgG4-related disease is a distinct entity. Um, it's a primary, uh, some people feel it's a primary disease, other people feel it's a response. And oftentimes what we refer to as what I just described, pseudotumor historically, about 25 to 50% of pseudotumor uh, is actually due to this IgG4 related disease. Now, honestly, I think it's 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 a it is a it is an interesting disease, but I don't think it's necessarily as common as it was once led to believe. Um, it has been associated with other disorders, both in the head and neck and systemically. So diseases that we would refer to as Michelet's disease or Kuttner's tumor are now felt to be due to local manifestations of IgG4 disease. And so the point is that anytime that you have something that you think could be pseudotumor, um, then you should always suggest the possibility of IgG4 disease with the understanding that it can be relatively rare. So these are examples of IgG4 disease. This is an example involving the medial rectus muscle, the superior rectus muscle. This was an example of IgG4 associated disease involving the orbit extending back into the cavernous sinus. You can see there's uh, pachymeningitis as well too. And another example of bilateral IgG4 disease involving the lacrimal gland. So, when you are giving your differential diagnosis, you know, you think of thyroid ophthalmopathy, you think of pseudotumor, and you think of IgG4-associated IgG4 disease, and also lymphoma. Remember to remember lymphoma as well, too. Now, this is an example of a venous malformation. 
So historically, we would call these hemangiomas. So what we see here, a diffusely enhancing uh, um, mass here involving the globe, we can see it's high signal on T2 and homogeneously enhances with contrast. So this is a hemangioma involved in the globe. And just realize now that we tend not to use the term cavernous hemangioma anymore. Rather, we use the term venous malformation. And what we specifically look for in these, what we used to call a cavernous hemangioma is delayed enhancement. So if you see something like this, these venous malformations or the cavernous hangiomas were the most common retrobulbar masses in people under 40 years old. Again, the name has changed, but the way we can make the diagnosis is to look for that delayed enhancement on CT or on MR. Another cause of proptosis is lymphatic malformation. So this is an example of a lymphatic malformation. Here we can see the high T2 signal associated with multiple small septations. Remember, lymphatic malformations can occasionally have small little vessels, in which case they're lymphatic capillary malformations. And if they end up bleeding, they can result in acute proptosis, here we can see the blood fluid level, and they can also result in distortion of the globe. Sometimes this is referred to as a tension globe, but these patients typically present with the acute onset of proptosis. Another cause of proptosis is a schwannoma. So this is an example of a schwannoma, and I can tell you they're a little bit more common than I initially thought. I think a lot of the schwannomas we probably called ve um, venous hemangiomas slash cavernous, uh, cavernous hemangiomas, but schwannomas, the way that, that I've been able to make the diagnosis is that when they're early, you know, it's hard to differentiate from other retrobulbar masses, but when they become large, they can end up giving regressive remodeling and expansion of the globe. So if I see a mass involving the, the retrobulbar area in the globe, and it, it's solid and enhances with contrast and it expands the bony orbit, then I start thinking about a schwannoma involving the orbit. Now, these do not arise from the cranial nerves. Remember the, excuse me, from the optic nerve. Remember the optic nerve is not a cranial nerve. So this does arise with, from Schwann cells and it's felt to arise from the Schwann cells that surround cranial nerves three, four, and six, these small little fibrillary branches. So just always include schwannomia or differential diagnosis. And if you see something like this that kind of expands the orbit, well, that really uh, starts to put schwannoma at the top of my list. So another cause of proptosis, and especially if you have a pulsatile exophthalmus, pulsatile proptosis, is sphenoid wing dysplasia. So sphenoid wing dysplasia is typically associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. So this is an example of that mesodermal dysplasia that's associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. Here we can see a large plexiform neurofibroma, absence of the um, posterior wall of the orbit, and this fibroma is extending all the way into the cavernous sinus. So the reason these patients have pulsatile uh, exophthalmus is that there is no bony separation between the pulsation of the CSF and the back of the orbit. Now, the CSF really, really moves a lot. I remember the days of pantopaque um, when, when people had residual pantopaque, and I was always amazed at the amount of pulsation. So as a result, when you have all of this pul pulsation that's directly transferred to the back of the orbit, that really caused the globes to go back and forth. So again, that's due to absence of that bony uh, separation between the pulsations and the globe. So these are all, again, another example of sphenoid wing dysplasias due to neurofibromatosis uh, type 1. And another example of uh, proptosis, again, pulsatile exophthalmus is CC fistulas. And there's two types of CC fistulas. You can have indirect CC fistulas, and it's unclear whether or not this is due to traumatic or whether it's due to congenital. But an indirect CC fistula are where branches of the external carotid artery um, have, are, are directly um, extend into the cavernous sinus. So this gives you the multiple dilated vessels right here. 
Um, and this is the direct CC fistula where you have direct communication with the artery and the vein and you have arterialization of the superior ophthalmic vein. So this is an example of, again, dilatation of the superior ophthalmic vein. CTA demonstrates arterialization of the vein. And again, as I mentioned before, just the nice sagittal images demonstrating enlargement uh, in arterialization of the superior ophthalmic vein. On the right here, this was an indirect fistula and this was a direct CC fistula. When we do talk about other causes of proptosis, you can have different disease entities involve the lacrimal gland and the lacrimal sac. So this is just an example of other disorders that can involve the lacrimal gland giving you proptosis. So you can have dermoids involving the lacrimal gland. In this case, you can have sarcoidosis involving the lacrimal gland. In this case, you can have primary neoplasms involving the lacrimal gland. This was adenoid cystic. And in this case, they had ended up having lymphoma that involved the lacrimal gland and extended into the superior portion of the globe. So just remember, proptosis can also be caused by abnormalities involving the lacrimal gland. And also proptosis can be caused by abnormalities involving the bony orbit. So anytime that you have uh, orbital abnormalities, such as fibrous dysplasia, you can see how this narrows the uh, retrobulbar area. This can result in unilateral proptosis. This was osteopetrosis, diffuse thickening of the, of the skull can result in bilateral proptosis. This was a patient that had a large meningioma that involved the greater wing of the sphenoid that resulted in proptosis. This has a similar appearance. This, in fact, was metastases that resulted in unilateral proptosis. And finally, you can have a variety of infectious processes that can involve the adjacent sinuses resulting in proptosis. So we talked about the Chandler classification, but just realize you can have mucoceles and infected mucoceles that can also give you proptosis. So in summary, what we talked about uh, over my, during my lecture was that we talked about anatomy, we talked about causes of leukocoria, a variety of infectious and inflammatory processes, and we finally ended with the discussion of proptosis. Thank you very much for your attention.